yeah. but you're bringing people together. You really like your posts, the things that you talk mm. about. They really bring people in. Thank you. I hope so. Feels it. That's how it feels. Yeah. I. It's. It's trying to make childhood adversity palpable, which you don't want to do because mm. we want to be real um, and share the stories and the statistics and the science in a sense that makes it very real and very human. But I know. Um, you know, when I grew up in a home in, with adversity and growing up being so angry and frustrated, why doesn't anybody understand? Mm. They don't understand if they don't know. Yeah. Right? So we have communities that just don't know that this adversity exists. So we have to be patient with the changes that happen and we have to be able to share the stories in a way that doesn't overwhelm people and make them feel oh, there's nothing I can do. So how do we bring about these conversations in a way that allows people to see that they have actual impact? Mm. So that's what I hope to do. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So what what exactly, just for everyone, mm -hmm. what is Starlings? So Starlings, so I'll give you a little story about how, why I chose the name Starlings. So Starlings are a type of bird, and what they do um, before they go to bed, kind of like kids need to be cozy um, or to stay warm, they roost. And so what they do is they do this beautiful aerial dance in the sky, and they can be thousands and thousands. Um, and I was really inspired by this because... Um, the research, what, it, what they hypothesize is that one bird influences its closest five to seven birds. They pay such close attention to each other that they can, they use those vibrations to really know when am I going to turn. And it really looks like a, just a beautiful ballet dance all together and it's incredible. Um, and that really inspired me as what a community can look like. That we don't have to have these, this huge impact and, 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 you know, think I need to change my community, I need to change the country. We can really start with the closest five to seven people next to us. Have those conversations, be present, um, listen to them truly how they're feeling, um, and make huge changes. So, wow, that's where the name Starlings come from. That's yes. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I love. It. Yeah. yeah, I love birds. So yeah. Um, and then um, how Starlings came about. Um, so basically, I started it. I guess a year ago officially, but I had. I mean, I have from 10 years ago files on my computer that say how to end homelessness, how to, um, you know, child of addictions. Um, and what I was recognizing, you know, as volunteering in the place that I volunteered, as a registered nurse, when you meet people really at their most vulnerable time, um, and that really that lack of understanding where um, we don't, we never know what happens behind closed doors to someone. Mm -hmm. um, I recognize, you know, a lot of anger issues that were in my family, you know, abusive issues, really negative coping skills in my home. So I knew that existed everywhere. I knew we weren't the only one, even if it felt like it. Um, so I really wanted to start to have those conversations with our kids. How do we grow empathy, empathy in our kids? And like you, you know, acknowledging their feelings, mm -hmm. starting with that. But how do we even expand that vision and really include the kids of our community? How can we be a support in the grocery store when we see a child? You know, even in that, that quick contact that we have, we can really make a difference. Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess that's where it started. It came from a place of really hopeful and a lot of anger, to be honest, at the crossroads of that. <laughs> Hope um, and anger. Yes, yeah. Those yeah, are two yeah, very yeah, powerful yes, totally, yeah, um, yeah. Under, underlines. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's how it started. Oh, that's amazing. In a nutshell. And, and so I don't know many people who have files on their computer of how to end homelessness and like, where does this come from? Um, so I grew up in a home. So we grew up in low income, low income housing. Um, and then, you know, growing up, I, I always, I always, I was very sensitive to other people who were in those situations. I was very sensitive to people around me, um, who were experiencing adversity in whatever capacity it was. And I knew that ending homelessness, you know, ending poverty, ending adversity, it wasn't just about giving money. So I knew for me, it really was about relationships. I, you know, what, you know, people ask, well, how come you're resilient? You know, they hear my parts of my story and they think like, what, you don't look like that. Um, but I was really fortunate. I had teachers that believed in me. Um, I made really good friendships along the way. And even if they didn't recognize the adversity that I was living through, I know that that's what made the difference for me. Um, but when I was out and hearing, you know, how to end homelessness and how to end poverty and how do we end adversity, it was never talking about those, those, um, relationships that really make an impact. And now there's tons of research that proves it and validates an individual within their adversity. So how do we get that information out to everybody else? Yes. How do we get that out? Mm -hmm. That's so important. Mm -hmm. I don't know 
A lot of people, I, I noticed that you're a, a fan of Children's First. Yes, yeah. yes, I am. Yes. <laughs> They're awesome. Yes. Yeah. I love Sarah Austin. Yeah. She's yeah. fabulous. Yeah. And, um, they put out a study, Raising Canada, hmm. that broke my heart. Hmm. And I don't think a lot of people realize that we're only number 25 in the world for child safety. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think it's because we don't, and I mean, a lot of, a lot of the things that Child First Day Report touches on, and I mean, what Sarah talks about often in, in, in her conversations, you know, it is things like poverty, obesity, abuse, you know, things that we don't talk about. And I mean, we have lots of kids striking for climate change, but there aren't going to be very many kids that are going to come forward and say, I'm being abused. I'm living with a parent with mental illness. I'm witnessing domestic violence. Well, you're not going to hear those. You're just not going to hear those stories. Yeah. That's too sensitive. It's too dark, right? Um, so I think, I think um, people just don't see that in our neighborhoods. We live in Canada. We're a really wealthy, affluent country. Um, you know, I've heard from my own friends. You know, well, we have it way better than you know a third world country. But adversity is adversity. A child's brain doesn't recognize that somebody else has it better. It doesn't. It would be wonderful if it worked that way, right? Mm -hmm. We can just show kids, you know the mountains and think, you know, this is what we have. Um, but it is about relationships. And regardless if you're in a third world country or Canada, it's just, that's going to, that's going to break that, right? Yes. That's yeah. so powerful. Yeah. I know you know a little bit about, well, probably a lot about the ACEs study. Yeah. Um, I remember, so for those who don't know, what is the ACEs? Can you just tell us? Yeah. So, um, the ACEs study was done in 1998. So what they essentially did, um, and I mean, people might have heard this story often, but it was, um, there was a doctor by the name of Dr. Vincent Felitti, and he basically uh, founded this by accident when he was running a program for people to lose weight. Um, and essentially he was finding, you know, the people who lost the most amount of weight in the quickest time relapsed really quickly. So he was wondering, you know, why is this happening and going through his regular questions. Um, he accidentally asked a lady, how old were you when you became sexually active? And she said 40 pounds, or how much did you weigh? He meant to say, how old were you? And he said, how much did you weigh when you were sexually active? And she said 40 pounds. He thought, whoa, what? And it turned out that she had experienced abuse. So he realized that maybe this is a key piece in, in why, why people, you know, why the people that were coming to him for help with losing weight and why people struggled really with keeping the weight off. Because they would have triggers and then they would start eating again. They would go to their coping skill that they knew. Um, so basically from then, they, him and another um, doctor called Dr. Anda, they did a study and it was a huge study of 17,000 individuals um, and it focused on um, household dysfunction, abuse and neglect. So household dysfunction being living with a parent with mental illness, a parent who um, has an addiction, witnessing domestic violence, um, incarcerated parent um, and um, and a divorce or um, separation or death of a parent. Um, and they found huge numbers um, that this is really common, that is one in three people has two or more ACEs. So two or more individuals um, experience, you know, living with a parent with mental illness, which automatically they're likely getting neglected because you can't be emotionally present for someone when you are emotionally deprived and, and needing to, um, you know, working through all of that. Um, when I did the ACE score, you know, my ACE score is seven and it was really validating um, in a sense that I didn't feel alone. I didn't feel isolated. I knew that um, that there was something different and that that we could change sort of our trajectory with assistance from other people. But that's really hard. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so um, the study, yeah, it was 1998 and then um, Alberta Family Wellness Initiative, they came out with a brain story certificate along with Harvard Education. <clears throat> excuse me and um, and they have done really great work um, but it's still really difficult right we don't we're not seeing this in our doctor's offices um, excuse me I'm selling my throat um, I mean how many times have you been asked about a mental illness or yeah doctor's office and schools you know are we trauma-informed in our schools I'm um, in our hospitals right so wow it's still a long way to go yeah yeah I remember so my son, actually, mm. in his school, someone had brought that in. Mm. My youngest. So my oldest Amazing. really struggles with mental health issues, right. de anxiety and depression. Right. But my youngest, I didn't realize how much our, our crisis mm. had impacted him. Mm. He's four years younger. And he took an ACEs test, and he got four. 
Right. And I, I felt the opposite, but I think it's yeah. because I'm, I'm the one who's supposed to be providing this mm -hmm. wonderful safe space mm -hmm. for my kids mm -hmm. and realizing I've worked so hard with my oldest that mm -hmm. my youngest was suffering. Mm -hmm. And I felt a lot of a shame, mm -hmm. which is the opposite of what this is for. Absolutely. And once I realized, wait a minute, um, when, people, when people can understand that these types of assessments are not to bring shame, they're mm -hmm. to bring awareness, mm -hmm. and then to know what, what's next. Mm -hmm. and, that's, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what you do as well, right? With mm -hmm. cups, mm -hmm. what, what's mm -hmm. next? They offer the mm -hmm. what's next, mm -hmm. don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, so um, they really do a lot of, um, I mean, with adversity, and I mean, similar to you, I experienced postpartum depression. I definitely had a lot of challenges, and I had a lot of shame and um, and grief around that as well. You know, um, you know, things I see in my kids today as well, like you, anxiety, depression. Um, it's easy to do the blame game, but mm. to recognize that it's not the end of the story, right? We're mm. lucky. We our brains are plastic, and we can build those new neural connections if we can really take the time to build those new neural connections. So, I mean, places like Cups, and there's, a, there's other not-for-profits as well that really focus on the family, right? We, we, we want to look at their, um, their strengths and really support them in understanding their challenges and where their trauma comes from. And that part of their story, a lot of people just think it's normal, right? So when they can understand that this isn't normal and you have adjusted to protect yourself, mm -hmm. and this really is a coping mechanism, can help people. And then, I mean, you're, you're equipped with parenting skills in those spaces, right? Um, a lot of things that, that when someone's lived through adversity, they don't have those skills, those parenting skills that just come naturally for some people. I mean, when I had one of my kids, you know, um, love and compassion towards them and that, you know, just wanting to snuggle them really was replaced with rage and anger and depression. Um, not something you expect, right? And it's, it's you know, a normal way that we're protecting ourselves initially and then it becomes malfunctioning and and our brain starts to really get triggered mm -hmm. um, so it's really finding a space that people can be themselves share their stories the dark parts of their stories and really be supported in that environment oh that's so powerful yeah. and, and to be reminded that all these things we really shame them like who do you tell no when you're no. angry or when no. you've raged mm -hmm. or when your child is threatening mm -hmm. you with knives like you don't mm -hmm. you don't tell anybody you no. bunker down and you just you keep no. it to yourself which is why we're number 25 exactly in the yeah. world so mm -hmm. it's amazing what happens when we put the humanity around mm -hmm. that welcome mm -hmm. to a human experience mm -hmm. and know that there's hope and there's change mm -hmm. that can happen which you've experienced mm -hmm. which i've experienced mm -hmm. in our homes yeah um where are some of these places you mentioned cups yeah i mean i think a lot of the not-for-profits i mean they all have their family centers right there's um like in from the cold has their family center and they really focus on the family unit mm. um right i mean a lot of the um other places like i know the drop-in center they're really trying to all of them are really trying to um apply a trauma-informed lens mm. right and it's um i mean there's a child um the child advocacy center my apologies um it used to be the um sheldon, sheldon kennedy. kennedy so i mean they really do a lot of work with that knowing that when kids are abused they're gonna have these challenges right um but the thing is, is it's also really important to recognize that it's not always abuse, that it's something so, so dramatic that we associate with um, adversity, you know, kind of that end story that we hear where someone is just completely traumatized. It happens over time and it happens, you know, in homes where there's mental illness and where there is addiction um, and that kids won't talk about because there's a lot of shame with that as well. You don't want to talk about your parents and how they act behind closed doors or what you experience, right? We put on a smile and everything is okay because we want to blend in. Yes. <laughs> right? So. And people have their idea of what abuse is. They exactly. think, oh, I don't hit my kid. Right. And yeah. that's why when I got that four out of ten with my youngest, mm -hmm. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, we're my husband and I, we've been married 20 right. years. Um, I don't hit my kids. No. But I sure yelled at yes. them. Yes, right, right, right. And I didn't realize that my rage mm -hmm. caused trauma. Mm -hmm. And instead of hiding it, mm -hmm. um, coming out and in safe spaces mm -hmm. and realizing that, oh, that can be changed, really helped. I think a lot of parents, A, they don't know what abuse is, and then they don't, would, I would never call yelling abuse, but it did, did something to my children's brain. Right, yeah. And I had to face that mm -hmm. courageously. Mm -hmm. and, and once we do that, it's it mm -hmm. normalizes things. Whereas mm -hmm. I think a lot of parents, 
even if they do abuse, I don't think any parent really wakes up in the morning and says, man, I just want to beat my kid. Yeah. We're, uh, yeah. Gabor Mate mm -hmm. talks about we're boxes within boxes mm -hmm. that get passed down. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we do things and we don't realize we're such a product mm -hmm. of the tapestry that has come behind us or before mm -hmm. us with our parents mm -hmm. and their parents. Mm -hmm. And somebody somewhere has got to be brave mm -hmm. to break the cycle and speak out mm -hmm. and say, I have... I need help, just like an mm -hmm. alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. need to stop. I need help. Exactly, yeah. And I think that's the thing is oftentimes the person doing the abuse has experienced trauma themselves. Yeah. So like you said, it has to stop at some point. But, um, but it's really difficult to stop if you don't feel you belong or have value or have purpose within the space that you occupy, right? And a lot of times people who struggle with addictions or mental illness or have those rage issues right even even um even you know myself when i was experiencing postpartum depression you don't see it in yourself in that moment and then you just get depressed afterwards beating yourself up right until someone can say um you know this is this it, you know lots of people experience this mm. right to make you feel that there is a space for you you know where people can understand that and not penalize you right um for Cute. for those for those actions yeah, yeah. Wow, that's, mm -hmm. wow, well this has been a really enlightening conversation. Mm -hmm. We we get to continue the conversation mm -hmm. at the Bell Let's Talk mm -hmm. conference. Um, I'm so excited to have you there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm excited that Dr. Jody Carrington is gonna start our day off because she's all about connection. Right. Yep. But then we put the power back mm -hmm. on the people who mm -hmm. are in the room to, to really talk and go deeper. Last year, you know, we just started the conversation. Mm -hmm. This year we go deeper. Um, but what would you what would you say to everyone about the idea of coming together for mental health and why is that so important? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think we all hear it takes a village, right? And we know that. I think we all innately know that. We can think of the people we lean on in our times of trouble. We can think of times when we've been isolated in our times of trouble and how that feels. Um, and I think when we come together and we can have these honest conversations. We can. That's where we'll make the biggest impact because it really is in the power of relationships, not not you know these silos that we create, but um, but collaborating and cooperating and really listening to each other. Um, we'll we can change the world. We do that. We yeah. can. Yeah. I, I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. And so um, uh, Agnes Starlings yes. at Starlings. Yeah. It's at Starlings underscore community at yeah. Starlings underscore community. I follow you. Mm. I am constantly challenged and and mm. and encouraged by everything you post thank so you. thanks for bringing the community together in in the ways that you're doing and um thank you yeah thank you well, you're doing yeah it's fun yeah it is it's well, important and fun yes. it's important yes. and fun. Yeah, totally. yeah and and likewise you know we can we can be inspired by the mm. hope and by the, the stirring up of the dissatisfaction yes. with yeah. the way it is yeah it doesn't have to be the way it is no yeah yeah so thanks mm -hmm. for being a huge advocate and and we hope to see every single one of you there. You need to meet Agnes mm, if you, you don't know her yet already. <laughs> now you know her face. <laughs> her face is out there. <laughs> out there.